you join me today at the wheel of one of the most unusual and brave pieces of French design of the 21st century. Yes, I am currently clad in the joyous leather of a Renault Avantime. And if you like watching unusual and interesting vehicles like this, then do please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification button, which I think is that side of that side, I forget which, and join me again for others in the future. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and if you've just bought an interesting, or what you think is an interesting SUV of some sort, I've got some bad news for you, because there's nothing quite as interesting or unusual on the road as this. From 2001 until 2003, Renault brought us the Avon Time, possibly the most unusual luxury coupe MPV thing ever. Now, the styling is slightly unusual, and it came from a guy called Patrick Lecremont, I think that's how you say it, uh, who had been with, first of all, Ford, brought us some quite interesting things like the cargo truck and the original Sierra before moving to Renault, where he designed the Twingo, the first Megane, the second Megane, and this. And it comes about in a strange set of circumstances because this is actually an indirect descendant of the Matra Rancho. The Matra Rancho unintentionally begat the Aspas. The Aspas grew up in time and, in a funny sort of way, gave us this. And this is also, of course, built for Renault by Matra. And Renault had an obligation to Matra to give them something to put down their production lines. It was a long-standing contract. And when the latest version of the Espace moved to an all-steel construction, and bear in mind Matra, their speciality is combinations of materials. So this is not all steel. They brought the new Espace in-house and they had to give them something new. Now, a gentleman called Philip Guidon in Matra had had a concept he'd been thinking about for a one-box design to encompass everything in one place for a luxury MPV coupe estate car with hints of convertible. And with Patrick Lecomont's styling input, made it happen. So if you look back at Patrick's previous work, you can see he was not afraid to take chances. The cargo with its little side windows in the door, the jelly mold Ford Sierra, and of course the Megane and the bustle back thing going on there. You can, his, uh, his history shows brave design, no more brave than here. And it's hard to define exactly what it is. It's a one box design rather than a two or a three box. It's pillarless doors when you, and frameless on the front. So you can see, all the way through, drop the side, and it's completely open. It has the characteristics of a coupe, an MPV, and a state car, a convertible when you hit the grand air button. And, uh, well, it's, it's almost impossible to define. It's built on a steel structure with composite panels on the outside. And even the name is a portmanteau, which incidentally is my favorite word of all time. Of the French word avant, meaning ahead of, and English word time, meaning time. Which is kind of ironic, because it was actually two years late in development. Now looking at the car from the front, you could be excused from thinking it is maybe some kind of an espace because it does share the underpinnings of the car, the structure, the substructure of the vehicle. But as you look at the details, you see there is so much more going on. These horizontal slats above the lights, this more interesting grille, everything is just way more interesting and unusual than an espace. And under the bonnet, we've got more good stuff going on. Now, under this surprisingly small and stubby bonnet, there are two engine choices, and there's one good one. First of all, there was a two litre turbo petrol, which is only available with a manual, and is probably the wrong choice for a car like this. Secondly is the correct choice, the V6, the same thing you'd find in a Laguna, a Safran, and a Clio V6 as well. This 24 valve three litre makes 207 horsepower and this will propel it up to 137 miles an hour. This also gave you the choice of a manual or an automatic. If you're on the continent, there was the choice of a diesel as well. Again, really not the right choice for this car. That was available in the Velsartis though. Now the side of the car is incredibly interesting. Look at all the lines and the shapes. The rear quarter is almost a Landau top going into this sort of convertible-ish kind of a roof. Maybe it looks like a hood from a certain angle. Pillarless doors, drop glass, which drops into the door as you pull the door handle. And these doors, with this very, very interesting hinge arrangement, and look at how long, first of all, these doors are, because this is a four-seater luxury MPV estate people carrying thing, but it's only a two door, three door if you include the boot. So it's got massively long doors. If you had doors that open normally, that were this long, they would be coming over here somewhere, so you can never get into them in a car park. So this has got double parallel or double kinematic door hinges, which mean the door opens forward and outwards 
uh, across the front wing, meaning you have an interesting aperture to get into, but you can actually open the car wide enough to get into in a car park. There is one more thing to mention about these doors and their, their heft, and that is their heft. These things weigh 56 kilos each. There are stories of people parking sideways on a hill and not being able to get out. So coming around the back of the car, we have got a very interesting tailgate area. You see where the Megan Series 2 bustle back uh, design almost came from. Being a little bit cautious against the ceiling, even though I know it's tall enough. Yeah, so lifting up the curiously shaped tailgate to go inside to the boot, and it is a big boot because this car is not only an MPV and a coupe and a luxury car and elements of a convertible, it's also kind of an estate car. Luggage space is good. There's 530 litres of space with the seats up and 900 with the seats down. Then we come to the load space cover, which is very big and very light. It's perhaps some kind of expandy foam material covered in flocked fabric. This can be moved down to here, there, or you can purchase a second one, as this owner has done, and create a raised boot floor. So you have a covered area here for keeping all your stuff here, lots of room for activities down there, hidden from view, and put other luggage on top, or have it as a deep well that you can put big, tall things in. However, it should be noticed the aperture is slightly an odd shape. It's vertical here, it's horizontal here. The interesting lights do cut in quite a long way, and the aperture itself is virtually waist height. So if you're trying to load a fairly large, struggling washing machine in here, it's gonna put up a fight and probably win. Now, while we're around the back, looking at the details, We've got a massive Renault logo. The Apple Time name is virtually at 45 degrees to the world. And then we have these tail lights. They're a work of mad art. All the lights are an individual triangle. They indicate the reverse light, the fog light, all intersect. And they're shaped in a demented figure of eight pattern in the body shut lines. And this upper area here, this small extra red light here, isn't even a light. It's just a panel that looks like a light, just to make the shape work. Right. So opening the door takes a little caution because it doesn't go as wide as you think it will. And then we can step in to the interior. Now this is an astonishingly rare car. Not only because it's an Aventine, but also because it has this interior. This is, I believe, the only one with the green leather upholstery. There were two option packs. One gave us the green dashboard. A second one gave us the green matching seats. And uh, I don't know how many there were to start with. I'm guessing not that many, um, but this is the only one that survives. We also, of course, have the green doors. Shaking Stevens was not involved in any stage in production of this car that I'm aware of. And let's climb in and have a look. It's quite a step up. We do have lots of buttons on the seats for heater and for, for movement. And the seat belt is actually mounted to the seat itself because, of course, it's pillarless. There's nowhere else to put that. We step over the sill, quite a wide sill. And you're sitting almost SUV height in here. So on the door, we have got the large green area up the top, a sculpted door handle above a big area for putting bits and pieces, which is divided into two. And then you'll notice how, because of that big double kinematic door handle, the door faces round at about 45 degrees or so, and actually changes shape as you open and close the door. That has to be unique. I don't think I've ever seen another car which operates in quite that way. So above the shut line, we've got the uh, door handle, which is metal. Then we've got the four electric windows and a speaker down the bottom. <clears throat> so we'll close this and then suddenly it's all one cohesive lump of door. Now moving into the dashboard, let's put the ignition on so we can see some stuff. It is a big, clean, clear area of T-shelf. So here we have this amazing green dashboard. I've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, the, apparently this is called Pack Exception, and that also gave you the two-tone wheel. I don't know if you can see that clearly. It's a little bit dark in this car park, here we go. The green and black wheel, we could only get this with this particular option pack. So we have the massive leather T-shelf. So it does balance extremely well in multiple locations. So there's plenty of room for aperitif, croissant, baguette, and many other French things, and a nice cup of tea. Patrick Lequimont was, of course, half French, was, of course, French and educated in England, so he could bring us exactly what no one wants. So he'd appreciate a cup of tea 
and some fine pastry. I would of course not use a hot coffee cup or indeed any pastry on this lovely leather dashboard because it's too nice. <clears throat> So this disappears a long way into the distance. I literally can't reach further than these displays. The window is just miles away. In the top of it, we have got large trapezoidal speakers. The central display, which is great for making things easy for left and right hand drive conversions, showing the speedometer, the temperature, the knot time, that kind of thing. And that's all up here in the middle. And below that, in a very late 90s Star Trek Next Generation style of dashboard, we have this lower full width band of vents and screens. These little air vents on the left, just a small cubby thing with a rubber base on the left hand side, more vents in the middle. And on the driver's side, instead of a cubby hole for putting useful items, we've got the rev counter and also the gear selector indicator before we find more air vents. Now on either side we've got individual dual zone climate controls. The passenger one just gives you a temperature option, the driver's one does give you significantly more. Then if you're a fan of storage things get very interesting because there are multiple, multiple storage bins around the car. First of all we have a glove box, that's no great shakes. It's not big, there's a pen clip, there's a felty area, this is no mobile phones for some reason, and a little cubby hole for small items. I don't know what would be little enough to go in there. Not a big glove box at all. Then you have another one down here, which slides out dramatically. All felt line and curvaceous, very nice indeed. Moving up above these three controls and a little bit of textured design going on there. We lift into the middle one. Now this is quite exciting. Not only does it have felty flock lined area at the front and dual coin holders, coin holder here, coin holder there. This is properly exciting. This goes down miles. You can actually lose the entire car's instruction manual in there. We have the only sighting of the car's trim level. It's not written on the doors, not written on the bonnet or the boot, not written even on the dashboard, but here inside the hidden no one knows it's here glove box is the word privilege. So we know we are driving a privilege. This is ridiculous. You'll also notice there's not the word Renault on the car anywhere either, just the logo. They were big on branding at the time, I guess. But it gets better for fans of cubby holes because underneath that we do have another concealed area. So beneath this flush fitting plastic panel here, we have the very, very swanky Renault CD changer. The radio displays of course up on the screen in front of us. And there's more cubbyage down there so we can lose things above the CD player if we wish and then if not using the CD changer, drop it back behind the plastic. Another one down here, this is just an ordinary ashtray for your sweetie wrappers and a 12 volt. And finally we have more storage back here. If you're a fan of storage this is definitely the car for you. Now moving back to the steering wheel, this is the early days of multifunction steering wheels in the early noughties, designed in the late 90s, so we've got various little buttons here on the wheel, only four of them, and a little Renault logo of course. Hiding behind that we do have the lights and indicators on one side, wipers on the right. What we do have here though, the horn, so with the horn test, very Parisian, I can hear this in arrondissement of Paris. And also hiding, very well concealed behind the, uh, the fingers of the wheel, is Renault's trademark radio control uh, obelisk, which lurks down here. So when you're driving straight forwards, you cannot choose what you're doing. You have to go around a corner to change the radio station or the volume. Down into the center, past all this lovely luscious green leather and interestingly textured plastic, we have the automatic gearbox. There was an a manual option on this particular car, which apparently doesn't really suit the character of the car. And also is a really badly designed looking gear stick. Uh, this moves back into a manual proper old fashioned handbrake, which is good, electric mirrors and various other little buttons. There is one more panel of controls in the car. You'll notice we have got the full, well, double glass roof, double panorama roof. There is one button in the center of this, which is a bit of the car's showpiece, really. This is the grand air button. And being the car's massive, important showpiece, naturally has virtually no indication it's here. Push this button and everything opens. All four windows drop. The roof winds back. 
And this is what I was talking about as being virtually in a convertible. It feels like you're in a Targa car because we've got roof above us, drop side windows, pillarless. So we are sitting in a big open space, all on a completely unmarked button. Okay, climbing to the back of the car, we have a fairly hefty handle to release and slide the front seat forward because this is a luxury car so naturally you do climb in by moving the seat forward then like in a discovery we've got grandstand theatre seating high level rear seats with a higher h point for for sitting in the back and seeing forward with theatre vision and climbing to the back it is again a massive step up you are really <laughs> reaching a long way into the car step up and it's a little high Oops. a little low on your back i should say and i did bang my back on there you climb in and sink into these lovely bucket seats in the back. It's only a four-seater. There is a fifth seat belt, but really it's only a four-seater for comfort. And you're surrounded by glass everywhere. So it's lovely and airy, no way claustrophobic. Not bad headroom because this glass does sit quite high up into the ceiling. Well, there is a, uh, a sun blind to stop you getting too hot in the head on a warm day. Down in the back, we've got double cup holders. We've got a power socket, a nice leather map holders on the back of both seats. Then things go dark because you pull the seat back, ouch, into the driving position and suddenly you've got no leg room at all. Bear in mind, this is based on an Espace, which is a three row of seating car. So you would expect tons of room in the back of this luxury MPV. I'll stress those words again, MPV multi-purpose vehicle or people carrier in the back you can just about squeeze two people in if they've got quite short legs now as i say the view is fantastic this is actually my eye line looking over the driver's head looking through this great big expanse of glass so you're sitting here thinking wow this is lovely could that guy in the front not move forward a bit more but really he can't because look at the depth of the dashboard the first tier of black then you've got the cliff face of dial of dials and instruments and things then you've got the forward fields the green fields of leather a meter or so of badly used space effectively so uh yeah you climb into the back here huge boot huge front seats so basically this is a two-seater in everyday use or a two plus two luxury mpv which apparently is a thing Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the uh, window switches here in the back are hidden, tucked between the leather of the seat and the door panel here. You can just about make them out in there next to this little cubby hole. You do have a nice leather armrest. So we're in, I'm going to turn this aircon down a wee bit if I can figure out how to. Oh my God, the controls are all hidden. They're over here. Ah, aircon down so you can hear me. Right, so the engine is already running, believe it or not. It's very, very quiet, this V6. The pedals are a little tight in terms of foot room above my, my toes. So be careful moving from go to stop. Now already just pulling into traffic, the front of the car feels a really long way away. If you can see the GoPro on the bonnet just there, that's about halfway down the bonnet. That's not even near the front bumper. I feel so high up in this thing. I feel like I'm in, like I say, in an SUV really, the, the height of it. Now rather wonderfully, this does come from the era of French cars where the ride is gloriously soft. Well, it's the tail end of that era, but uh, it's still caught the good bits. Now, power from that V6 is effortless. And it just slips through the gears in the automatic quite happily. So when Renault first revealed the Avon Time to the world, it wasn't at a motor show, it was actually at a press launch in the Louvre in Paris. They, called it, they didn't even call it the Avon Time, they called it the U-Space. 
so it feels like a big luxury car but the amount of light and air around you these huge a-post quarter light windows give you an amazing view of the road in both directions now the power steering on this thing is quite good it's nicely weighted in so much as that it's not fingertip light but it's still assisted enough that you're not going to raise a sweat going around a corner which kind of suits the nature of the car and also with a softish suspension it kind of works well in conjunction with that. Now something you might have noticed when I first started the car was the fact it used a key rather than the uh, credit card thing which Renault were going all out to promote around this time that this car was actually put on the market. Uh, the Laguna had it, the Megane 2 had that little credit card smart thing. And the problem with that is that because this used an older Aspas frame and uh, underpinnings, it didn't have the multiplex wiring that was needed, so they had to kind of retrofit that stuff to the car during the design stages, which is quite a job, I can tell you. But it really needed it, because uh, for any kind of luxury car coming out around the turn of the millennium, you absolutely had to have all the good stuff like rain-sensing wipers and automatic headlights, all those clever little gadgety things that people buying the, well, basically the, the boring Teutonic barges that have been tuned for performance in the Autobahn, they're going to be expecting that. If you're going to lure them away into something mad and gallic like this, then you're absolutely going to have to have the luxury features to take away from the fact that it won't do the Nürburgring in eight and a half minutes. Now the concept that gave rise to this car was quite interesting. Basically the uh, people at Matra knew the Aspas had been massively popular as a family car back in the, uh, well, in the 80s into the early 90s and they wanted something that they thought that the children of Aspas owners could latch onto because they would have fallen in love with the car as a child and those childhood memories would translate into sales in the 21st century for their new Aspas derived grown up more luxurious thing that they'd be just the right age to go and buy. Now, driving around this uh, slightly smaller road than I'd anticipated driving down, you do uh, really appreciate the incredible view out of the car. You can see everywhere so clearly. Now, there, is there any sound quite as rich and melodious as a V6 just idling away, tickling along? Well, we're going to hear it revving a little more because we're pulling onto a dual carriageway now. Feel the V6 power, Rrr. very nice. Moderate the V6 power, there's a speed camera, not nice. Now something the designers said about this car when they were putting it together and launching it was that they wanted people to walk around it and be astonished every time they looked at something new, which is admirable in design terms. However, not something you may be wanting to say about a car you want to sell a lot of. And perhaps that's telling in the fact that they only sold 8,552 of the things. Uh, well, globally or Europe-wide, I don't think they sold it anywhere outside of Europe. In the UK, I think they managed to sell around 300 of them, which is absolutely nothing. And it's very sad because it is a really interesting, creative car. Lots of unusual solutions to things you just don't otherwise see. Look at this big slab of leather dashboard. That's so, that's just so cool. So it's luxurious. These big panels of buttons here, leaving the entire center swathe empty. This is not like any other car you're gonna be coming across. But it was up against Renault themselves. They also brought out the Velsartis, which was sort of a similar concept, but really much, much more sensible. So uh, this thing really lost sales to itself. And because Renault were pushing the Velsartis, which was built in house, so they're presu presumably therefore a better profit margin, they weren't really pushing the Avon time. I noticed I say Avon time, not Avon team, because it was that portmanteau of the English and the French. So it's kind of sad that this thing had such great potential, but was never realized. And towards the end, Renault were telling their dealers just to get rid of these things at any cost. People were buying them two thirds off. So some people got some incredible bargains. There was one story of a guy who ran an IT company, bought nine of them to be a fleet of vehicles for his, his people to drive. But spotting one of these in the wild today is a very rare occurrence indeed. Velsartis sold a few more, but even so, seeing one of those is cause for celebration. 
Okay, we're out on the dual carriageway and the car is just wafting along. You can tell it was designed for those long, open French roads which go on and on between the fields. And you could sit there with the, well, okay, I've shut all the glass right now so you don't get the wind noise, but you could have the roof back, the windows down. It would be like being in a convertible or at the very least a Targa which is, of course, all the benefits of a convertible with very few of the drawbacks. It does waft. It's not as soft as some French cars are, but it does still have a nice bit of, bit of roll to it. Now, often when we talk about cars becoming harder and harder to keep on the road, often it's either rust or, with more modern cars, electrical faults. With these things, it's availability of parts. Things like the tail lights are, well, very rare to come by, 600 quid if you break one. Uh, a lot of the glass and panels just not available. If you break a window, potentially you've just totaled the car on the insurance because you can't get another one. So people owning these cars do have to be fairly careful. And things like the uh, green paint around these switches goes kind of tacky, which is a, a trait of a lot of late 90s, even early 90s products. The rubbers and the paint start going kind of icky and tacky after a while. So this is gonna have to be uh, stripped off and cleaned and repainted in something the same color before too long. I am sitting here in incredible comfort. The air is just wafting from those great big vents on the dashboard. There are vents here in the door, wafting air that way. My view is incredible down the road. I'm sitting fairly high up, so I've got a great view out. You do feel a little bit rock and rolly as uh, you go over bumps and things, but not too bad. Now something you notice with the pedals, obviously there are only two of them, it's the automatic, but the very short travel, there's not much travel on the brake pedal and very little travel on the accelerator either. So you have to be a little bit careful moderating your, your throttle inputs. Although of course being an automatic, if you do mash it a little harder than planned, it will just rev and then the automatic will take up the, uh, the slack if you like. So it won't jerk and roll away. It's just very, very smooth. Let's go for a bit of an acceleration run down the, down the slip road. You see the electronic segmented rev counter in front of me, rising up to about 3,000, 3,500 RPM as we accelerated down the slipway. Slip road, it's not a boat. And we're away. It is such a comfortable thing to be in. Got the big armrest beside you, a captain's chair feel of the big armchairs, and you just waft along. It feels like you're driving an RV, really. And these cars have been on my radar for a long time. I've always been intrigued by the, the crazy design, the really unusual aspect of just two doors on a four-door car, the giant, huge coupe look. When they say the hot hatches and coupes are a dying breed, this was a breed that never happened. This is a chimera, never mind a unicorn. It can have some beans when it wants it to. You need to, to burst into traffic. The three litre V6 will explode forward, give you some revs, give you some power. It does feel strange driving such a minimalistic cabin because all the controls are clustered here for the yeah, air conditioning. Just your stalks on the, on the steering column and almost nothing else to see. In a way, it's foreshadowing all of the things like the on one screen for everything being a touch screen and hiding all the controls elsewhere that we have today, but in a more binary analog method. Now this was unfortunately about the last car that Matra built because although Renault were obligated to give them product, when, however, this was a slow seller and perhaps in part the lack of sales of this car contributed to Matra ultimately going under, stopping building cars. So it is a significant vehicle in the history of motor manufacture because not only is it perhaps Renault's biggest flop, it's also the last car we ever saw from Matra. Okay, I've just found a shortcoming with this car, and that is, although we've got a huge quarter light window here, this A-post is just absolutely vast. I'm going around this right-hander here. I have no clue where the road goes or what's on it. We leaning. I'm leaning, I'm leaning a lot, We. This is fun. I like this car. This is so much fun. Such an enjoyable thing. 
Hello, thanks for joining me today in this car. It is absolutely bonkers, but all the better for it. There are some shortcomings. Those doors are particularly unusual. The uh, car is vast, but the cabin isn't that big for a four-seater. It's massive for a two-seater, which effectively is what the car becomes, a two plus two. But for all that, it's just brave and individual and different. And yeah, I'm gonna say it, I love it. It's brilliant. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit that subscribe button, do hit the like button, leave a comment below if you've driven anything un more unusual than this. If you've been in one of these cars, then let us know, because not many people will have done. And join me again next time driving something completely different when hopefully I won't have this horrible stinking cold.